Hello, everybody. Uh, Rainer Sternfeld, head of Data Platforms Group at Inetrust. Lovely to be here. And uh, I understand it's an afternoon, so I'm, and we have to catch up. So we're hoping that we're going to catch your attention a little bit. Um, welcome, everybody, for joining me today. And uh, I'd like to talk about the intersection of renewables and data. And so maybe if we could start with a short round of introduction here, who is who and what do you do? Uh, Ingo, why don't we start with you? Yes, um, I'm with uh, Electric, as you can see. Uh, well, as you can't see, <laughs> um, which is a solar EPC. So we're building solar power stations and, and batteries, large scale, utility scale um, equipment. I got started in the automotive and mechanical engineering industries and never wanted to work with utilities. Never, ever. Somehow I ended up there. Um, I always thought it's possibly the most boring place in the world to work for, and actually it turned around to be exactly the opposite. Um, so I started to work for RWE in 2000 with the first profit warning of, uh, uh, in the history of the company after roughly 100 years. And I was doing investor relations back then, so it was a tough job. Um, Ten years later, I was uh, leading a Energy Plus company in retail for RWE and was actually um, suggesting to the board to set up, uh, to launch a solar um, product and was told to stop that, to not even think about it. So uh, seven years, eight years later, um, we changed our minds. So I resurfaced um, in the solar industry because Energy, the, the spin-off from... Uh, from uh, RWE um, was actually buying Belectric, the solar company. And now I'm actually doing what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to be among the good guys so that I can tell my little daughter, you know, what I'm doing and she can understand that, you know, right away, producing energy from, from sun rays uh, to make her iPhone work. So uh, actually that feels completely different than 20 years ago. So really the utility sector now is a really inspiring place to work for. Thomas, please. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was on a panel this morning, so I'll, I'll be very brief. But uh, first, I totally agree with this in the sense that with the energy transition going on, there is no more exciting place to work than the energy industry. And it's a very important place to work. And uh, in the context of this panel, what, what uh, Axelos uh, can enable from the data perspective is the end game for us is to enable lower LCOE in particular for offshore wind and of onshore wind. So that, that's where uh, we stand in, in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Christoph Mertens. I'm, I'm working with a Japanese trading house called Sumitomo Corporation. For uh, non-Japanese, it's always a little bit difficult to explain what trading houses are doing. Um, I tend to explain it's a local it's a global corner store where you can buy, basically buy everything. So it uh, includes mineral products, machinery. Um, the company owns a couple of square kilometers of forest in New Zealand. If, if you happen to fly into Dusseldorf using Ryanair, here in Europe, about 80% of Ryanair's aircraft fleet is owned by a leasing company, which again then is owned by Sumitomo, if you, which is probably more likely used by one of the large commercial airlines. Um, some of the aircraft engines they use, again, are leased from Sumitomo Corporation. Um, the company has a telephone company in Japan. Um, it's really something uh, which is relatively unique. There's few of these trading houses um, in Japan. And they all experience more or less the same trend about 20 years ago, when the margins, the traditional uh, trading profit margins came down. Those companies started investing in infrastructure projects, which at that time were conventional power plants, and then gradually moved into renewable energy. So nowadays, the com our company owns about 7.7 .7 gigawatt um, consolidated net capacity on a global level. Here in Europe, it's only offshore wind, plus one small um, PV asset in Spain, and on, on the Tenerife island, um, the rest is about nearly half a gigawatt now offshore wind, which we, which we invested into in the, in the last couple of years. Um, we, we are now facing also this transition, what to do with the data, what, but I think to cut, cut things a little short, we'll come to that in a minute, uh, the next steps ahead. Will do, yeah. Uh, you've heard quite a bit about me, I suppose, from this morning and also the talk, but I, I look after strategy and what we call future energy, uh, which is really 
how we see the, the business model in the future for, for energy companies for Origin Energy. So. Thank you. So I thought maybe we start off uh, talking about the maturity of digitalization efforts in, in renewables, and maybe Ingo, can you give us uh, your view on the state of um, solar, since we have quite a lot of solar representation here on this panel today? Yeah, actually, um, I have to admit, when Thomas uh, called me up and asked me if I would uh, be willing to join this panel, I thought, you know, if you want to have a, a party pooper on the panel, then, then I'm, I'm you know, happy to come, because uh, actually I think the solar sector is, is, is behind the pack, also behind the wind industry, and, and uh, needs to learn a lot more things before we can actually say that we are applying, really applying data-driven uh, business models in our sector, at least when it comes to building and operating uh, power stations, solar power stations. It's like um, if you look at, uh, at a BMW website, um, they talk about Freude am Fahren, the fun of driving, and it's a lot about the engine that is uh, underneath the hood. And then if you go to, do you know Byton? You know this uh, Chinese um, e-mobility company? If you go to their website, they don't talk about engines at all. Um, they talk about the um, digital experience. They show their apps, you know, there's health apps and all sorts of entertainment apps and styling apps and whatever, what have you. And actually my kids don't care what's underneath the hood. They care about being connected, you know, having cool apps available. And this is something that I, as, as an analogy, would also uh, use to, to describe what's going on in the solar sector. Um, in our world, it's like, you know, we're, we're still the, uh, the BMW world, where investors who are investing and, and building um, large solar power stations are looking at the capex, are the build, at the building cost. You know, that's like the engine, uh, which in a couple of years from now will not play that much of a role, actually, because equipment is getting ever better, so we will have longer lifetimes of plants. We're talking 20 years, we'll be talking 30 years, well, we're doing that already now, and, and 40 years, and all of a sudden, there's going to be a, a turning point in the way you look at the uh, levelized cost of electricity and the O&M cost. So the operations and maintenance, the operation of solar power stations is going to be much more important than, you know, the cost of buying solar modules, substructure, and inverters. But no one is really there at this stage. So that's maybe a bit of a, of a visionary statement. Maybe I'm being stupid, but that's at least what, what my reading of the whole thing is. So looking at my little company, um, we have lots of data. You know, we have four. We're just building a big solar power station in, in New South Wales, 350 megawatt. Actually, I would love to build a solar power station for you guys as well. A little bit of a sales pitch, sorry. Um, but this 350 megawatt power station. Um, is actually generating something like 24,000 parameters per second. And we have 400 utility scale solar power stations. And if you add this up, you come to billions, billions of data transactions per day that we store on a cloud-based platform. So there is already a cloud-based platform. Wow, you know, this is sort of revolutionary for our sector. But what, what are we doing actually with these data? A little bit we do. So we, we for instance, provide um, failure diagnostics. So we compare inverted data, we compare irradiation data, whatever, to, to find um, the, the root cause for failures to reduce downtimes. We do a little bit of advanced analytics. We do long-term comparisons of, of plant data. Um, but there's a lot more to be had and, and things that play much more of a role when it comes to to operational cost for 20, 30, 40 years of lifetime. So things like producing the kilowatt hour at exactly the right time in a subsidy-free world, where we don't talk between 20 to 50 euro cent per kilowatt hour, but let's say four, five, six. So any kilowatt hour then is going to count. So the more data you have and the better you use your data, um, the better you'll be making money as, as an investor. And you can forget about the investment cost of the plant. So um, preventive maintenance um, is going to be a big thing around this. I was visiting a Bosch factory um, last week. They have all that. Internet of Things and the factory is all done. Forget about the solar sector if you compare. So there's a lot of catching up to be done. Plus, combining grid data with inverter data on site. 
So that is already being done, but we're just at the very beginning of it. So the dream is to exactly know when exactly you can put a kilowatt hour into the grid, at what price, and of course that also um, is referring to integration of batteries. So data is going to be the new fuel for the success of solar plants in the future, not the price of solar panels, inverters, and the substructure. Maybe that thank was a bit of a too long statement. But that's good. That's good. We'll come back to some of these things. But thank you, uh, Thomas. Now you you help companies to lower the their LCOE or at least help them to to get things started. So in your opinion, um, a lot of companies are collecting data. In your opinion, are they doing much with it? Do you think they're utilizing the data in their disposal to the right extent? So. A couple of things. So on the predictive maintenance front, not 99% of the data collected is absolutely not relevant because it does not correspond to a failure of the equipment. So if you want to predict failure, the only data that matters is a failure data point. So that makes 99.9% .9 of the data irrelevant, which is where we come in by providing a, a way to create virtual failure histogram, which are richer and more accurate than what could be done on, a, on rare failure events in the field. But <clears throat> from the LCOE perspective, the very important uh, other angle is at the design stage. And here, I really agree. Uh, I think the industry is actually 20 years late on another industry in terms of sharing the data. So if we look at the EDA industry, electronic design, when comes a time for a circuit designer or an equipment designer to, to, to act, he goes into cadence or synopsis and he has access through the software to all the data of all the components and how they behave in the system. We do not have that in the wind industry and that definitely hampers any effort to optimize how we build offshore wind farm, for example. We cannot get to an LCOE for offshore wind farm which will be competitive with onshore, but more importantly competitive with fossil, but more importantly competitive with life extension of fossil fuel plants, because that's how we win the energy transition. We cannot get to that unless we optimize everything, and that means that the industry must come together in sharing the data, not the design, but the data of how a component behaves in a system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Well, Christoph, uh, how does that look like from a, a trading house point of view? And maybe to expand that, are you, what other data sets are you looking at when you're making these decisions, not just operational, but across the board from uh, weather and uh, uh, unit economics and things like that? Um, we're working in a relatively strong risk-averse environment. Um, we, we need to find a very good reasoning why we would like to invest and put our money into another offshore wind farm. And part of that is clearly the quality and the amount of data we are getting in the future is way more detailed and we can predict some failures um, and we can operate more efficiently. Um, it, it's especially in offshore wind, it makes a big difference because the, the maintenance offshore costs between three and ten times what it costs to do the same job onshore. Um, especially when, when some of these pur purple, uh, special purpose vessels, ships are needed that have a big crane installed in them. Um, so they, they come at day charges of up to $500,000 a day. Um, in order to be really efficient, um, you really have to have to have all or maximum data possible available. Now the time when, when the offshore wind projects are planned and, and engineered and designed, um, the measurement equipment is state of the art, more or less, I would say. By the time that the turbines get commissioned, it's already outdated because, of course, the, the complexity and the development moves so fast. Um, we, we are now operating relatively new projects, so all of them being commissioned in the last three to less than one year, um, and, and still we experience things like very reasonably one turbine generator broke down very unexpectedly because the operator failed to feed his own operations and management system with some data he, he should have known or he knew, he just failed to put it into the system and draw the right conclusions. So for us, it's always a little bit annoying when that happens, but it also tells us we need to be very, very closely involved. So this complexity is nothing that allows you as an operator to lean back and be relaxed. You have to be involved, even from an investor's perspective, which is a little bit more remote than the 
direct operator's perspective yet, but you have to ask questions. Um, we need to challenge the annual operational budget. We need to ask the construction budget. Um, we need to ask the remote sensing that is implemented. And hopefully that will then pay off during the lifetime. And that will also pay off at the end of the lifetime when we start discussions about lifetime extension, um, especially in this area because the fatigue loads in offshore wind, if they're not yet exceeded, you cannot in another five years, which is then hopefully the golden end of the life cycle. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, Tony, uh, if I remember correctly, 30% of Origin's retail households have solar rooftops. Um, how do you look at the state of solar in Australia and how do you use that data to, for your operations? Yeah, so, so I think the biggest challenge that we, that we have with that is that we, we haven't really used that data particularly well. Um, and I'd say that, I, I, I say that in two ways. One, firstly is like the customer experience of buying a solar PV that, you know, I don't think the industry has used the data of customer consumption uh, the orientation of their rooftop, what the, what the correct size of the panel is. So there's a fair amount of over-investment in, in solar PV uh, where the customer gets a feed-in tariff well less than what it would have cost them. Uh, so I don't think that's been particularly good and it's starting to rise to that challenge. I think the second one for us really is around what the total aggregate impact is to the market. So we, we buy, as uh, Frank alluded to this morning, we, we buy about half the energy uh, that we sell from the market. So, you know, 10 years ago, or probably even less, you would have come in and we would refer to uh, working weekdays in summer as all having the same demand profile. Uh, and we would set the book up uh, or the portfolio up accordingly. Now you will come in every day and that's quite different. So there's, we have to, and, and we're, we're much more advanced in this side of the business is we have to be much more advanced in the data and analytics and in the forecasting we run to start to take account of what the impact is in the market. And when you take that to the extreme of more wind and more, uh, probably more large size, you know, grid size uh, solar systems, then, you know, trading that duck curve and managing that, that, that intra, intraday uh, uh, demand and price impact is, is, is going to be even more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. If I can start my next question with you and go back the other way is that um, when you think about working with the data that you're supposed to own and you're supposed to control, when you think about working with third party analytics providers or insurance providers or government or even competitors, um, what are some of the challenges you see in, in exchanging or sharing data as we say? Yeah, sure. I, I, I would say that you know, we don't have, uh, to, my, to my point in the, in the speech, I don't think we have data standards uh, which enable that to be done easily. So it's, it's, it's mostly done through bilateral mm -hmm. arrangements. Um, and, and so I, I see that, that, that that's not really scalable as we, as we try and take, you know, uh, the industry to, to the next, uh, next level of um, renewables and, and distributed generation. So I, I think by and large, that's, that's the biggest challenge we do. Uh, outsource some analytics uh, to, to third parties and as, as I say that's mostly done on a bilateral but to do it at scale it needs to have the standards and interoperability between participants and I think that's where the market needs to get together and I think that is potentially the biggest risk in all of this in that um, whatever the weakest link is uh, in terms of market uh, participant uh, in terms of a data breach or a data issue uh, then the whole industry is held to account. All right. Christoph? Um, yeah, for, for us, we being coming from an investor's perspective, we're a little bit more remote to the data, so yes. we can't get our fingertips directly on the data. Um, we have contracted an operator to do that. For, for instance, we're doing one project together with Energy in the UK, and Energy is also the operator of that offshore wind farm, together with some, some other investors. Um, and it is running pretty nice, but the, the, the complexity is that the OEM reserves some of the data, his property, his intellectual property. So even energy as an operator cannot access 100% of the data. So part of that is being carved out. 
And us sitting on the second row, for us it's even more difficult saying we would like to have an overview online what is going on that specific turbine. So first we need to ask energy and then they need to ask the OEM if it's okay that we can have access to the data. So we, we, and we're not even trying. We once did, but this, this is leading nowhere we realize. But so instead we try to have some, some systems in place that give us sufficient comfort that energy is in a position to manage that investment on our behalf as, as good as possible. And thinking in the future, I'd like to have more data connected, like what is the ideal weather forecast? What can be potential grid constraints? What will be um, consumers' behavior in the next 24 hours so we can maximize or put the operator in a position to maximize the revenue stream from that project, um, which is then adding a huge level of complexity on top of what we're dealing with at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thomas, you... Uh, you're on the analytics side of things. Are you, when you provide services to your customers, are you worried about uh, compromising the IP of your algorithms? Um, so yeah, I think we, we have to differentiate between IP and data. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a way for everybody to keep their IP and yet not silo data. I think that's very important. Now the, the next step is to really realize that the value we can obtain from data is absolutely exponential with how much data we put together. Right, so every time we silo data, someone may, th may think, one stakeholder may think, oh, I'm, I'm going to make a bit more money because I siloed data. That is gonna be dwarfed by how much money is lost by not aggregating data together and realizing this exp exponential value. <clears throat> and, and, and we're going to lose in the energy transition from the at least offshore wind farm perspective if we don't move there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ingo. I mean, for us, the most, um, well, first of all, working together with startups is very important for us because we're talking about six months rather than six years when it comes to innovation cycles. We had this topic this morning. Um, so we can't follow the, the typical old utilities um, innovation timings. Um, going to be real fast. So for that, you can't survive without startups. Um, but the data then are owned by us or by the customer. And that to us is the crucial question. Would the customer allow us to use his data to do, let's say, um, data or um, advanced analytics across our portfolio of 400 uh, power stations? I would say on an anonymized basis, that's not an issue. Other companies like inverter companies, you know, SMA, um, GE, ABB, um, they have these data as well, so we got to be fast and not wait, but, but, but move. And I think we can anonymize data and still do, you know, very sophisticated advanced analytics. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a EPC, you also have to deal with other kinds of data, not just performance operational exactly. data. So we're talking about supply chain from, from design files to, to ERP to PLM systems. Is that important to you as well? Or? Yes, funnily, here also, you know, the sector is like 10, 20 years behind because for project management, um, you can use pretty nice tools um, beyond the um, MS project in order to really close to wherever the module is. Um, we don't even know where the containers are. You know, if we send, we are sending currently 2,700 containers from Europe, China, Saudi Arabia um, to uh, New South Wales. Um, and we don't know where the containers are, so we depend on um, the likes of, you know, these logistic companies who don't always do a good enough job. So we have problems to track and trace when the containers are going to be on site, and, and that can be deadly for, for your project if there's an issue. Um, and and it, would, it would be so, you know, inexpensive to, to equip a container um, with a, you know, a SIM card, you know, or whatever kind of electronic device to exactly locate where the container is. And you could do the same thing with a lot of other things um, across the, the site in order to exactly know what kind of progress you're making. So I think here also there's a lot of catching up to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thomas, uh, in, in trying to help companies to lower their LCOE, um, you know, Europe is, is, is uh, sort of living in a, or entering a post-subsidy uh, world. Um, from a unit economics point of view, or from a long-term profitability point of view, how do you see this being done right now? And is your work 
uh, helping them and, and what do you see is missing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll have to, this is a broad question, I'll have to take a pretty uh, axillocentric view on this. Please. Um, the way we can, we can work com um, companies with uh, lowering LCO is very simple, it's uh, optimal design. So if you, if you think about what it takes to do the optimal design of a wind farm, um, let's just start with the jacket structures for, say, a 50, uh, wind, 50 strong wind farm in, uh, in shallow waters. You're going to have to go after topology optimization, geometry optimization, thickness optimization, and so on. And then this is supposed to be all coupled with the way the rest of the system reacts, so the top, uh, the tower, and the blades, and the drivetrain of the wind farm. This becomes an extremely complex optimization problem. And the way we can help is because we solve what is essentially the physical equation of how this behaves um, a thousand times faster than any, any other software, and because we have these parameters, we can enable this optimization. So that's number one. At a higher level, what's uh, really also interesting about this is we have sensors on the asset, which are not ours, but uh, we, we, we can take data from sensors to understand how the asset reacts in real operating conditions. So now it's been designed, but it's deployed. And here, this can really inform the next generation of design because we better understand how an asset is reacting to the, the, the real world. And therefore, we can better optimize and lower LCOE further. I think the, the poster child company in my mind for this, um, I'm, I don't want to ruffle any feather, but it, it's actually uh, Orsted. So Orsted used to be Dong, uh, used to be the <coughs> leading oil and gas company in Denmark now, 100% renewables. But what they do very well is really learn from every project to really reinvest into their engineering so that the next project leverages that learning and lowers the cost of LCOE further, yeah, mm -hmm. the LCOE further, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Christoph, you said that you work in a pretty risk-averse environment uh, and, and uh, in having a lot of different assets, you are obviously thinking about risk exposure to, um, to your company. So the question I have for you is that how, do, how are you using that data to lower your risk, uh, if at all, or how would you like to? Um, that's, that's a very good question. So we, we're trying to have, um, first of all, spread out the portfolio in dif different jurisdictions and different energy markets, which in our case, it's still Europe, so it's, it's on a small scale, but it's France, UK, and Belgium. Uh, unfortunately, I'm always a little bit embarrassed, not yet Germany, but the German electricity market is a little bit difficult at the moment. So um, this is the first thing. We, we deploy different technologies, so different providers um, that at least gives us some comfort if, if there should be a design flaw with one of the turbines, um, it's not going to affect the whole fleet, so we haven't put all eggs in the same basket. And of course, we are also looking in, into uh, other and new offshore wind markets and, and also other renewable assets, so we, we, we haven't excluded PV or onshore wind. Um, we also, when, when there is a good opportunity, we, we're looking into those as well. Um, this is the one thing. The other thing that is, that is driving us and that ties in what you're saying is uh, what's after the end of the feed-in tariff regime. There is going to be another 10 plus years of operations and we need to know that we will be able to sell the electricity at a very good price. Um, the feed-in tariff regime is, should, at, in the ideal case, at least re recover the, the capex plus some, some revenue probably. But the next 10 years are really essential. We've got to do maintenance, we've got to operate, and we've got to decommissioning all these 50, 70, 80 turbines one point in time. And if, if we can use not only the operational data, but in a clever way connect this with what is the, the uh, cost for trading electricity now, or can, can combine it in, in, in a clever way um, to provide additional services out of a renewable assets like um, fast containment res response or other things that are very well paid, um, that's something really, really in in intelligent and is probably helping us to get more comfort. There is more we can do with the asset than straightforward power generation only. Mm -hmm. Tony, uh, the Australian energy market uh, and energy prices may be, can be pretty volatile at times. So. Uh, managing demand and supply using data uh, at a greater fidelity is is important to you. So, 
what do you think are the steps that you would like to take, whether it's uh, a peer-to-peer -peer energy network with a virtual power plant, or what's, how, how in your vision you would like to take this uh, yes. to, to kind of smoothen out the, the price peaks? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're probably pretty good in the analog world uh, in terms of trading, and it's, as uh, Frank indicated earlier, it's probably our core DNA. Uh, but when you look at that at a distributed level with millions of potentially connected devices and distributed assets and, you know, you overlay not just the, the wholesale energy price but uh, ancillary services and frequency control type prices uh, as well as avoided network investments as, as, as potential um, value pools as well, it starts to become too complex for, you know, uh, the average trader to be able to do, and it's just it's too 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 much information. So, we, we, we've been on a journey probably the last two or three years to literally, and this is no easy uh, task in a utility, take every single bit of data uh, relating to our business, whether it's customer data, uh, whether it's trading system data, uh, and and put it into mm. into the cloud, um, and then we've gone about trying to codify. Uh, what we do in an analog world, in a digital world, so that we're able to um, to do that over millions of devices. So that that's the direction that uh, we, we think the market's going to take. Um, we um, that's the core capability I think that that we need to develop. And as I said, it every day becomes different. I think once you put batteries into the system, it starts to. The value of electrons then becomes what is the price now versus in the future where we live in a world now where as soon as you produce an electron you have to consume it so the price is kind of instantaneous so all of these things will change and right so as a as a final question which maybe feel free not to respond if it's too unpopular if it, um in in the efforts to decarbonize the energy mix um running 100% of on renewables, um, is it feasible in your opinion or not? And what about nuclear? Maybe we'll start with Ingo. Well, we're talking about the real world, don't we? Yeah. So for my country, it's not feasible, but not for, you know, um, sector reasons, but for political reasons. Um, currently, I don't think the grid is equipped or is, is set up in a way that can take 100% renewables without gas peakers. Um, and also we need l mag many megawatts of batteries to be able to stabilize the system. But what many people don't know, a solar power plant can supply grid stabilization services with the inverters. We can supply reactive power and we do that. And we could do a lot more um, with the data, of course, if we connect with the grids in a, more, in a smarter way. And that would also help um, to make this um, vision, um, a, well, doable vision. Thank you. I'm not the expert, but I definitely am very optimistic it can be. At the same time, I would ask, is it really necessary? Um, global warming is a problem we have to bleed through a thousand cuts. And so we're not looking for a silver bullet here. Um, it, you know, you have to look at agriculture in the realm of global warming, you have to look at energy, you have to look at many different places. If we go for data, uh, in, in Milan at the World Energy Council, the, the CEO of California, ISO, was saying, look, we can run our grid on 56% renewables today, up from 20%, and that's, that's a huge improvement. And if you ask five or six years back, everybody would have said it was impossible. But what we had to do is, yeah, we had to change the system. The way we organize our grid has to be different because it takes into account renewables in order to get to 56%. We, we all know this here. Um, I, I think it's just, if we don't get there, it will just be a failure of imagination. It won't be a physical limit to that. Um, <clears throat> but the real question is, uh, let's not forget that this is not the only concern with global warming. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's many other problems to solve there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what, what, what you've been saying. Um, I, 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 it's definitely possible to come to 100% to renewables, but of course not only or not without battery storage, without um, CCGD peakers or open gas turbine peakers. That will be essential anyway. Um, but um, so there's, 
I think it's, it's going to take a while and it's, it requires a lot of changes. Uh, looking, for instance, at the regulation. Usually the energy regulation we have in our market stems from 20 years back when we still were operating huge power, coal-fired power plants. Um, and the, the whole environment and infrastructure was different from what has evolved in the last 10 years. Um, in Europe, the winter package is one way or a good approach to harmonize European regulations and to structure and be more responsive to renewables and get also a good fair payment to providing grid services, ancillary services, etc. Um, so I think the regulation system, the regulatory system, the technology is following slowly and it's going to take a while. Um, and you've been asked, also been asking about nuclear. I, <laughs> I spent the ten, first 10 years of my career as a mechanical engineer in, in the nuclear industry. Um, and, and the beauty of it is fully carbon free. Um, the problem is it's way too expensive. If we look at Hinkley C in the UK at the moment, um, that power plant needs to get a, a, a CFD contract for difference price, which is close to 100 pound per megawatt hour, subject to full inflation and guaranteed for another 60 years. And at the same time, the big offshore wind projects, they close around 63. It's a constantly falling trend. Um, so there is... Um, there is Commercially, is no more niche for nuclear. Technically, there may be a niche. Um, from CO2 point of view, there may be a niche, but, but technically, um, it's been outrun by renewables. Tony? Yeah, um, I, th I think it's challenging for different, different countries. Um, I mean, I think certainly in Australia, there's the land mass and the, um, the ability, but you know, you saw from the presentation the amount of cost that would go into sort of backboning the transmission system to, to do that. And so I think it starts to become one about uh, cost and, and, and timing. We, we certainly see, you know, that uh, certainly in Australia for a period of time, uh, open cycle gas and pumped hydro, et cetera, so having to support, you know, even increasing renewables to, to the levels that we're seeing uh, wanting to be achieved over the next sort of five or ten years, so I think it's a it's a challenge to get to the last leg, and I think it, 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 unless we can solve quite a few things, the cost of that will be quite expensive to do the last 10, 20 percent. Mm, thank you. Well, I have I have good news. We've uh, caught up with our schedule. We're right on time. Um, does anybody have any questions to the panelists? If not, then gentlemen, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.